I will correct APC's errors and support state police, says Atiku Abubakar. And DSS calls for calm after the United States issues security alert. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anokon. The presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Atiku Abubakar, on Sunday or Saturday, said he would reverse the wrong of the ruling All Progressive Congress if elected in 2023. Atiku Abubakar specifically vowed to establish state police that would not be used to harass Nigerians at the local level. He was speaking at the presidential campaign of the People's Democratic Party at the Samuel Ugbemudia Stadium in Benin City, Edo State. Take a listen. This country, they have destroyed you, your educational opportunities. They have destroyed your job opportunities. APC is not a party to be supported. We promise to restore security. Whatever it is going to take us to do, we shall restore the security in this country. So that you can travel there at night, so that you can go to your farms, so that you can go to anywhere secure. Again, we promise to revive the economy of this country. What do we mean by that? We mean we will make sure that our industries, our factories resume production in this country. We will make sure that there are enough jobs for our youth who are passing out from the schools. This is what we mean by reviving the economy. Well, joining us is uh, a PDP chieftain, Ose Aneni. Ose, it's so good to have you join us. Good evening. Glad to be here. <laughs> Great. Um, we, we, we listened to this on the weekend. Uh, Saturday, uh, everybody was watching to, um, you know, listen to what your presidential candidate had to say in um, Edo State. But I want to start with, you know, some of the things that he talked about, the rot in the system, talking about corruption. Um, and he talks about different aspects of the economy. But let's start with the corruption because it seems to be at the bottom of everything that's wrong in this country. Um, there are many who would say that your candidate is not in a position to speak about the issue of corruption, being that his principal at the time, um, former President Ngulushe Gwambasanjo, had written a book called My Watch and, and had somewhat um, rubbished his personality and called and, and made some allegations that were yet to, um, you know, get a, some, some sudden responses to. But they're saying, if a Buhari who we all thought was going to be a no-nonsense person is unable to deal with the issue of corruption, what, what place does an Atiku have in that fight? Uh, once again, that, I'm glad to be here. You, you mentioned um, allegations of Bassanjo made in his book. I think it's, it was called My Watch. My uh, Watch. It's a really good book. It details his, his uh, stint in government. Um, but when you talk about corruption allegations and you're actually accusing someone of crime or of criminality, um, this isn't something that um, you can just take offhand or just take, um, trust me, I, I believe he's corrupt and, and therefore, you know, the person is indicted just, just off your word. Article is one of the most investigated political actors we, we have ever had in Nigeria. He was investigated by a passenger, and nothing was found um, to indict him or to even convict him or to even prosecute him. You know, so a passenger himself in 2019, I think, endorsed Atiku. So, so I, I think it just is a distraction, especially when you look at what Obasanjo and Atiku did whilst they were in government. They were the ones that actually created the, the crime-fighting institutions we have now, like the EFCC and the ICPC. So if you're looking for a track record of someone who, uh, uh, who, has, who has shown an appetite, appetite to actually fight cor corruption and want to move beyond just mere allegations, Atiku is the person that has um, that track record. I just want to put that, that on the record. And, and that sort of like dovetails into the second part of your question. Why, when you ask me, if someone like President Buhari failed to fight corruption when he came into office, why do we think um, Atiku is going to be successful? And again, it boils down to, you know, uh, almost like a forensic investigation of people's track records. When Buhari came into office in 1984, he was removed by his fellow colleagues because his very, very short uh, tenure was also played with corruption. It was also played with impunity. 
And it was that record we somehow decided to bring forward in 2015 to say this man was a disciplinarian, um, even though he had no track record of fighting corruption, and uh, let's give him another bite at the apple. Um, like I said, Atiku has been part of a government that created institutions that fought corruption successfully. Um, the PDP administration has been one that has gone beyond just mere words. If you recall, it was the PDP administration that introduced the single treasury account. Um, remember, uh, but, President but failed Jules to implement Jules. it. But failed to implement it. Introduced, but failed to implement it. We must add. They that. actually. It, it was being implemented. There actually is no society that doesn't have corruption. So what you try to do is reduce it to its barest minimum. And what the, what the Good Luck Jonathan administration was doing at the time was a phased introduction of the Shingo Treasury account. So it was being rolled out, but in phases. When Buhari came into office, uh, high on, on, on the mantra of tackling corruption, uh, you know, he, he, he adopted a whole scale implementation of the TSA, and that was one of the reasons why our economy crashed at the time. Yeah, so as I was saying, I was talking about why Buhari, one of the reasons why Buhari failed to fight corruption successfully. I think he didn't understand that, you know, it's institutions and processes that actually limit it in any society. Um, and he thought it would just be the toga of um, his personality that would drive it. Of, of course, that has failed. Uh, corruption has never been at levels this high ever before. And we, we sort of are, you know, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs where we sort of are now in 2022, asking to go back to where we were in 2015. Um, what I'm hoping that will happen is, you know, even, even better than 2015, we'll go back to where we were in 1999, where things were really bad. And in three years, um, Atiku and Obasanjo had made Nigeria the fastest growing economy in Africa and one of the fastest in the world. Okay. Let's move away from that and let's talk about um, the issues uh, that he raised. He talked about the fact that um, he was going to do whatever it took to, you know, bring security to Nigerians. And we know that insecurity is rife. I mean, every part of this country, whichever direction you look, uh, there's always something that's happened. Um, I mean, there's been kidnaps in Lagos. Soldiers have been killed. Uh, sorry, not Lagos, uh, in Abuja. Um, I mean, we've seen all kinds of things happen. The, thank goodness the train uh, kidnap victims have been released finally, the last batch of them. But um, this is, uh, for, for, for a lot of Nigerians, this is something that almost every government campaigned you know, on. Um, the Buhari administration campaigned on it in 2015, campaigned on it again in 2019. Um, the APC government, of course, the Tinubu, who, Tinubu who's the APC candidate, is also campaigning on those things. And I'm wondering, um, why, do you, why is it that insecurity seems to be a, a thing that we're unable to deal with? Because one of the things that President Muhammad Buhari did say he was going to put an end to was insecurity. He was going to decimate, I choose that word carefully, you know, Boko Haram. And now we have a hydra-headed monster, which is not just Boko Haram, but we also have banditry. We have kidnapping and unknown gunmen in every part of the country. So... Um, is it just another campaign rhetoric as opposed to the action plan that we need to deal with this insecurity? Um, so, interestingly enough, you know, I, I've been at home all day. I don't know if you guys saw the, there was a security alert um, sent out, I think, by the U.S. Embassy warning its, um, its citizens of possible terror attacks in the capital city, Abuja. So most of us in, in Abuja really didn't go out. We didn't go to schools. We didn't go to the markets or malls or hotels or hospitals um, just because of um, literally fear for our lives. And, and I think for me personally, the, my frustration is that Nigeria has always tackled these problems and the solutions have, have really haven't changed. Most societies that have tackled insecurity have done so from the bottom up. So it's county level, it's local government level, it's state level before you start dealing with national and territorial issues. And that's literally what Atiku is saying. For um, more than 27 years, there was a, conf a lot of people don't know there was a constitutional conference in, in 1995. So for more than 27 years, he has been pushing for a devolution of powers, one of which is state police, is devolving security issues to the states and local government areas so that at that local level, they can tackle those local security threats, whether it's um, petty crime, whether it's more serious issues like domestic crimes and murder, 
that occur within local communities. Local police um, are better able to handle them. And then what that does immediately is that it, it frees up the, the army, the military, the Air Force, the Navy, uh, and all these military arms to actually focus on what their, their core mandate is, to protect the territorial integrity of the nation from external and internal threats. So they would then be able to um, tackle Boko Haram completely uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with no distractions at all. You know, it's, it's, it's not the norm when you see soldiers at checkpoints. It's not the norm when you see soldiers. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Soldiers escorting VIP personnel. Um, soldiers are, are, are trained to kill. They are trained to protect the nation. And part of Article's plan is to develop the policing structure so that you have state police, maybe even local government police, and then you can rearm, retool, re-equip, uh, retrain, and recruit soldiers um, so that they can then focus on, on protecting us from threats like Boko Haram. It's, it's, again, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it's, it's not a new problem. It's something that has worked all over the world. And, and I think maybe what sets Atiku um, aside, apart from all the other candidates is that he's, first of all, the only person who has consistently harped on this message. And secondly, he's the only one that can build the elite consensus you need to get this pushed through the national and state assemblies. As much as this is a brilliant idea and, and, and it's something that people have tinkered on you know, over and over again, uh, but then there are concerns. Some of the major concerns are these people becoming a private militia to governors in different states. Another thing is the issue of financing, knowing that certain states uh, always go cap in hand to the federal government or in, to Abuja every month to you know, get some form of <laughs> handout. Um, how, what's the certainty that states would be able to cater to these police officers? Um, again, you know, when we talk about about Atiku's plan, you know, it's it's you know focusing on the unity of Nigeria, its security, its the economy, its education, and I think for, um, more relevant to this conversation is the devolution of powers. So that would include things like fiscal federalism. It would include things like resource control, and that would address the concerns, the legitimate concerns you raise about states being able to fund their state or um, local government security outfits. Um, for a lot of people who, um, who don't know, most states already have vigilante outfits that they fund. Most states already have uh, security networks that they support. I think the only distinction here is that these outfits are not allowed to carry you know, um, heavy weaponry. You know, so they might get firearms licenses, but are limited to using shotguns uh, state police would actually allow the governor to command and control and equip a, a, a police force that would be able to match and even exceed the firepower of these bandits and criminals. So that sort of is the distinction. It's not, it's not a pipe dream. It's something that is part of a recipe of policies that the, the, my candidate article wants to push through. And you don't pick one without carrying out the other. You don't pick, for instance, state police without carrying out fiscal federalism. You don't carry out resource control, for instance, without devolving things like healthcare and education and agriculture and sports, so that the resources that states use um, acquire can then be used to drive other areas of de um, development at the subnational and local government levels. Um, so, so that sort of is why this plan would work and it's why other plans have failed. Okay, let's move away from that and talk about the politics um, around the campaign. Um, you know, you and I always get into this. Um, now, Governor Wiki had some things to say about the Edo State um, ra um, Rally. Now, for whether you've noticed the fact that Governor Wiki was not there, Ikbeazu was not there, Shea Makinde of your state was not there, uh, Governor Tom, Governor Ugwai, I beg your pardon, and then a, a faction of the Edo State Legacy Group were also absent. Uh, and, and what does this mean for the, the PDP? But before then, let's take a listen to what Governor Wiki had to say over the weekend. Ask me, oh, why is it that they don't see uh, the presidential candidate's uh, picture, the party chairman? I said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? The presidential candidate entered my state and picked members of the presidential council without the whole governor of the state having a contribution. The presidential candidate entered River State, picked those he wants to pick without the contribution of the governor. 
So they said they don't need me to campaign for them. That you don't want the mass people to campaign for them. Will you force yourself? No. Will you force yourself? No. If someone says he doesn't want to, will you go and push yourself? No. You sit down and do the work you can do. And that is the end of it. I have never seen how people would disrespect a state like River State and go and choose those who are enemies of the state. Enemies of the state. Without the contribution of we. So that's what they did. And so most of you may not even know, you may not even understand who is our nominee in the campaign council they have. Do we have anyone? So they don't want us to campaign. So let's campaign for those who have told us to campaign for them. The government candidate, the senatorial candidate, they told us to campaign for them. And so we are here to campaign for them. If they want us to be involved in the campaign, they will come and tell us, is it not? So we won't go and uh, force anybody. So I said, um, I, the too many questions that he raised. I'd like to start by the, you know, the, with the one he's talking, making allegations about the fact that the your presidential candidate came to the state, picked people without the consent of the governor, didn't even ask for a, a nominee from the governor. I, I appreciate that you're not a Tiku Abubakar, neither are you sitting at the head of the campaign council, but you must have an idea. So help us understand these allegations that Governor Wiki has made. Um, so first of all, you know, as we always do when I come on your show and we talk about Governor Wiki, um, I, 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 I gush with praise. He's our star governor. I think he was recently awarded by the president himself. Uh, so, you know, whenever I speak with him and what he has done in his eight years almost, you know, it, it, it's one of, it's, it's with one of pride. He sort of like set an example or what governors should do, or what you can actually do when you get into public office. Um, so I doff my hat off to him. Um, but when we come to the politics, um, as it involves rescuing Nigeria from the precipice, I, 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 I sort of feel there may be, so they may sort of have been, and I'm trying to be very careful with the words I, I use, as you can tell, they may have been sort of like a, uh, he may have taken a wrong turn. I think Governor Wiki fails to realize that, you know, this isn't about Atiku and this isn't just about River State. It's about Nigeria. It literally is about um, rescuing Nigeria. You spoke about the hydra headed monster of insecurity, for instance, when you tackled Boko Haram or tried to tackle Boko Haram in the Northeast. They then spread to almost every other part of the country, and then other heads spring up, kidnapping, banditry, unknown government, militants in Niger Delta. And this is replicated in almost every sector, in the economy, in our agricultural sector. I think we're almost reaching, heading towards 30% uh, food inflation because of the recent flooding. We're hitting record levels of flooding. We've never had this before. It's actually higher than the, the, the devastation we suffered in 2012. We have more than 600 people killed. We have more than 2 million people affected and displaced by the flooding. You know, so when I hear Governor Wiki play partisan politics with Nigeria's fate and future, it's, it's sort of concerning. What exactly me. do you mean by he's playing partisan politics? As a member of your, uh, your, your party, your political party, he's one of the people who have highly criticized this government. And if, if he's saying certain things because he feels like he's been robbed, especially for what he said uh, in that video clip, he's saying he's not being carried along. They're not wanted. They do not want us to campaign for them. What exactly is partisan politics there? Well, partisan po politics, for instance, is going into Lagos State and endorsing uh, Jide Sanwulu when, when your party has um, a candidate who is offering a plan um, better than what J.J. Samuel is offering. Um, partisan politics is when you... But did he, you, did, you I'm, I'm so sorry to talk over you, did, but did he really endorse Governor Samuel or did he just say that he has done well and for someone who's done well, he deserves a second term? Did he say, we're going to make sure that you become governor a second term? I mean, it's debatable, isn't it? Because many of his people have been on this show and they've made that, you know, they've tried to make that, uh, draw that line that he only just, um, you know, applauded 
a governor who has done well in his first tenure? It's, it's semantics. You know, Governor Wiki doesn't have a vote to cast in River State. So if he exactly. goes into the state, if he goes into the state, his word then is what carries weight. And if he says, you've done enough to deserve a second term, he's telling his, his, the PDP uh, in Lagos that, you know, their candidate hasn't done enough to, to earn a first term or doesn't have plans that um, surpass whatever Samuel Lu has, has done in his first term. A first term that included, for instance, the shooting of an unarmed protest protesters at the Lekki toll gate. Mm -hmm. And I can go on and on. It, it, it really is for me almost disheartening when I see um, emotion get in the way of, you know, like I said, nation building or nation rebuilding. Um, there is no way, um, at, my candidate Atiku has met Governor Wike several times, has met him in Abuja, has actually fl flown out of the country and met him abroad. And so when Governor Wike says he isn't being asked to campaign for Atiku, um, that isn't quite correct. In fact, before Governor Wike's uh, recent statement, he actually said he has no problem with Atiku as a candidate. He has a problem with the party and the national chairman. So this is a vote phase when you now come and say because the campaign council was, was um, um, put together, when you, sh you clearly showed no interest in being a part of his composition, and that's the reason why you are not going to campaign for a presidential candidate. It's problematic to me because, um, again, Wiki is a very influential governor. River State is very influential and very important to any chance we want to have of winning the 2023 elections. Um, and, I, and I hope, that, I, I think maybe what gives me some hope and some comfort is that we still have three months between now and start of elections. My candidate continues to make up, um, reproachments to the governor Wiki and his five, the other four governors. Um, the door continues to be open. We are constantly looking to find a middle ground. Again, just so that we can come together, not to fight between ourselves, but to actually put, put, um, put forward a coherent plan and a campaign that can win in 2023. I think that should be uppermost in everybody's mind and it, it sort of is distressing when Governor Wilkie, my leader, doesn't, doesn't seem to realize how precarious the situation is. Let's talk about um, the issue of unity, the unity of Nigeria. Um, it's one of the most important things that we need right now, being that, of course, as a country, we know that we're very divided along religious, political and, of course, ethnic lines. And these lines have become broader and broader by the day. Um, but then, like I always say, pundits have said that at this point, Nigerians need a unifier. And I'm going to put it to you. Does your candidate prioritize unity? How much of it does he prioritize? And, and what are the characteristics that we can point to uh, in your candidate over the years that we've known him in the political scene or on the political scene? Um, can we really point to certain things that we would say this qualifies him as a unifier and this is why people should vote for him? Well, I, I'll speak to the present before I speak to the past. Uh, we have a five-point agenda. Um, it's, you know, for, for ease of remembrance, it's called the unity seed. So it's unity, the full word, and then S-E-E-D, security, the economy, education, and devolution of powers. And if you notice, it's only unity that is spelled out in full. It's unity that is the first point of that five-point agenda. And it just shows, you know, it, it was deliberately so to send out a clear message that Nigeria's most fundamental problem is that we are deeply, deeply divided. I don't think we've been um, as divided as we are today since maybe the Civil War. And my candidate realizes that unless we tackle um, those divisions, unless we sit down at a table and address them, you cannot address anything. You can't address insecurity, for instance, because if you go after unknown government in the Southeast, for instance, they'll say you're you pushing a persecution against the Igbos. If you go against um, kidnappers in the southwest, they say you're going against the Yorubas. If you, if you go against uh, Boko Haram in the northeast, as happened in 2014 and 2015, they'll say you are, you, are, you are oppressing northerners. You know, so you need to unite and build consensus across the nation. And Atiku is the only person that has said Nigerian problems are so big, are so huge, that one person and one party cannot do it alone. So if he wins, he's going to build a coalition of like minds. He's going to form a unity government that will work together to rescue Nigeria. Um, okay. If you talk about what he has done, go ahead, sorry. 
because we don't have time, I, I, I just want to quickly put in my last question so that we can wrap things up. Um, your party, alongside the Labour Party and some other people, have criticised the um, manifesto of the <laughs> APC candidates, um, saying that it, it's a plagiarised version of MKU Abiola's Hope uh, 93 manifesto. Um, what's your take on it and why are you bothered about another person's manifesto when you have your own plate full? Um, so first of all, um, I'm personally bothered because I realized that we have three leading candidates. Uh, we have my candidate's article, we have Tinubu and we have Peter Albi. And any one of them can win and become president of Nigeria. And I'm concerned particularly about Tinubu's manifesto because it's literally a recipe for disaster. I think uh, it's an 80-page document. Um, if you haven't read it, I think you should because it reads like a horror um, novel. Um, the only good thing about it is maybe his housing plans and he wants to give Nigerians um, more access to mortgages so that we can buy uh, cheap and medium priced houses. So that's good. But everything else was ridiculous. He wants to triple, quadruple all production to 4 million barrels per day by 2030. And does that mean we're going to leave OPEC because OPEC actually sets quotas for Nigeria? He wants to remove spending caps, um, budgetary spending caps and delink uh, uh, spending to for, to revenue and actually say, you know what, if Nigeria's budget is $50 trillion, the government should be able to spend $50, $50 trillion. It, it's very similar to um, the plan that uh, Roosevelt did when they had the uh, Great de depression, depression back in America. Okay. But the difference is that they had a depression and we don't. We're suffering from uh, inflation. Uh, pumping this amount of money because he's literally saying he wants to print money to employ people and give them value by just paying them a salary. Mm. If you do that, we're going to spiral into hyperinflation. Mm. Um, I can go on and on about everything that's wrong with the document. It's, it's his plans on insecurity. He doesn't actually say he's going to give state police. He just wants to um, um, strengthen existing structures. He doesn't actually say he wants to de um, push through fiscal federalism. He just says he'll give a, a greater share of the piece of the pie to states and local government areas. Um, he talks very glibly about blockchain and um, fintech. Uh, it's clear he has no understanding of what that is. Okay. And his idea of youth empowerment is literally hiring an army of young people to go into the farms and become subsistence farmers. When, uh, when Dr. Yemi Kali, the MBS statistician general, said the greatest poverty trap in Nigeria is subsistence farming. If you get into subsistence farming, you might be able to earn a living, but you will never rise above poverty. So it, it's, it's a plan designed to enrich, I think, a few people, but impoverish the nation at all, uh, completely. He wants to give us a national career uh, when we are already drowning in debt. Um, I, I think it was it was it was a, a manifesto put together by consultants who have no uh, idea of Nigeria's present state. Okay. Um, I don't think Tinubu himself believes in, in 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 that document, apart from maybe printing of Naira, which he has said he would do for. Um, I, I've heard him speak at several for I talk about printing Naira. So apart from that. Um, it's a very troubling document. Uh, just if, just on the strength of that document, yeah. I pray Tinubu never wins, becomes president of Nigeria. Well, Osaneni, always a pleasure to have a conversation with you. Osaneni is a People's Democratic Party chief team. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll take a break. Thank you all for staying with us. When we return, we'll be talking about the uh, U.S. Um, government security warning to, of terror um, in Abuja and, of course, what the nation must do to avert these attacks. Stay with us.